All right, so here we go. And maybe uh, I won't introduce myself again. You guys are already either asleep or, or know who I am. And um, so I'm going to start off by uh, introducing something that's sort of in common, common themes across all of the work that we've been doing and specs that we've been creating at OCP. Um, and then I'm going to go through the individual specs and, and kind of introduce them. So the idea here is to get you interested in things that we're working on and they're not, they're not already built, right? So in many cases, these things are still on the drawing board. We're looking for community. We're looking for other people who want to walk the same kind of path and bring your inputs. If, if a spec that we have can be broadened to include applicability and, and usefulness to other carriers, that for us is a big win, right? And for you too, I would think. So the first thing that's common across of these things is disaggregation and SDN enablement. So what we're trying to do is create minimal software and state in the box. And you probably picked that up in the last talk, right? Um, and so one of the things that we think makes sense there is to try to tease apart the access technologies, whether it's G.Fast or or GPON or XGSPON or NGPON, any one of those things, right? Try to separate that out from things that happen other, uh, deeper in the network, like aggregation and subscriber management. Um, we also really are kind of keen on being able to sort of recompose um, things that uh, were small elements or small functions into more complex things. And we, for example, if you take a, a typical kind of broadband network gateway, it's a subscriber management device. It usually you know, lets people attach to the network and then provides like, the internet service rate and you know, polices and shapes to that and, um, and d does number of functions in one single box, right? It does subscriber management, it does aggregation, it does routing, for example. And when we disaggregate an element like that, we kind of dis pull those things apart so that the subscriber management is there and it's probably fairly unique to wireline and then aggregation is something that happens fairly similarly in many places in the network and I can reuse an aggregation that's not intimately attached to all these other functions and the same thing is true with routing that routing happens in many places in the network and if I haven't tightly bundled my routing with wireline subscriber management, I can reuse that much more easily in the network than I could before. Um, we also have a number of hardware design strategies that kind of, you probably already read through this while I was going on and on, but um, so reducing memory um, because there's less firmware to support, uh, removing flash when we can. So a lot of times the system on chip devices like to boot from a flash right next to it. But if we make the assumption that this is part of a cloud, it can boot from storage, right? It doesn't have to have that flash on board. And that, if you think about the operations that follows from that, so you don't have to do the care and feeding and updating and, and what happens when it didn't flash correctly uh, and that sort of thing. Um, we like to put the local aggregation into white box switches. So if you have an access technology, it attaches to a fabric, just like computers attach to a fabric in a data center, and that fabric becomes your aggregation. It pulls together many things and can send it out a few, a few links up, upstream. Um, one of the things we're trying to do is kind of create a common operations environment, and so pulling things like uh, BMC from the IT world and say, well, wouldn't that work great for the telco world? Right? You don't have to send somebody there to get to the console, for example. Or what if this was actually an outside plant? You don't have to roll a truck there to put somebody on the console. That could be really helpful. Um, and then uh, we try to uh, run the control and management software in a separate computer. That was a lot like the theme in the, in the, previous, um, in the previous talk. But in this case, it doesn't have to be quite so distributed as a getting started model. Just you know, one or two containers in a separate compute that's in the same, in the same data center or in the same cloud instance is sufficient. Okay. So the first section is gonna, we're gonna talk a little bit about PON. Um, we have three different specs that um, you've probably all, well, we've, we've introduced them all before, so it's really gonna be an update on where are we with these specs. And then after that, we'll talk about G.Fast. So um, the first one is a 16-port um, D3 
the 16-port, uh, one-rack unit uh, pizza box. We've presented this now, I think, for the first time last year. And um, there's good news here that since the first time we brought it forward, the merchant silicon that, uh, that we based it on has become available. <laughs> so we've been, able to, we've been able to make some good progress on this. Um, we've made a couple of modifications. Um, uh, inter if, you, if you remember from before, we've simply moved the uplinks off to the side. They used to be in the center, and this just makes for easier cabling in, in the environment. Um, there is now a blue light. Okay, so if you guys are familiar with servers, you know that there's a, a typical low-level management that makes what a light flash that sells the tech. This is the one to work on. Wow, what a great idea. We could put that on a network element. <laughs> So there's a blue light, so we get blue light specials now. <laughs> you know, um, but little things like that, they add up, right, with, with operations cost. And, um, and then we've also moved to uh, a, more, a more powerful CPU option, and we're under consideration to see if we really need it. Remember I said earlier, a lot of this silicon has in-band ways to manage it, and um, as we're start learning about the ability to manage the, the silicon that's in this box in band, we'd be eager to see if we can't do without the CPU. Okay. Okay, any questions or comments? Okay, then we'll go on to the next one. So if it's good in a large size, why not, you know, make it smaller? And so this is the Mac Mini. Um, it's a four port. It's the same basic technology. Uh, it's in a it's an anema enclosure, so the idea here is that for four ports, we could put this outside. It could be on a telephone pole or in a pedestal or in the basement of a multi-dwelling unit. And um, so it's like we pre previously pre presented it. It's, um, it's uh, you know, it's the same kind of box, but smaller. And we think that there are a lot of gains to be had for a device like this with the ability to remotely boot and to get the BMC to be able to do things that would have needed to be done with a console port. Oh, is the right word uh, base, ma base machine? Base that, thank you, baseband management controller. It's the, right? <laughs> baseboard, baseboard management controller. It's the extra ethernet port that you usually find on the back of a server that allows you to get into it even when the server hasn't been initialized or the processor has crashed or what have you. And you can usually pull up a console. Uh, you can usually do low level things like reinitialize the server. Same idea here, as if the, if the network element has gone crazy, I've still got a way to get in and try to do things that I would have been able to do with hands-on if, uh, if I were there. And then, um, well, in a, in a box like this, there's this question, does ComExpress make sense? Do you want to have a daughter card in a, in a ruggedized environment like this? And so we wonder much more strongly if we can just pull it out and, and manage it remotely. Okay, and then lastly, um, also happy to say, um, there's the single plug optic, and we've just started um, getting samples of these. And so th this is, uh, there are no updates to the spec. It's still the same that it was when we introduced it a year ago. But the good news is that we're starting to see some very limited availability of this kind of device as well. All right. Uh, nah, nah. Well, OK, so the, yeah, so the, question, uh, the question in the front was no BMC in that. And you know, you, you raise a really good question. And when we get to the G dot fast specs, I, we actually got this notion of, okay, the thing is so small and so simple, you really can't justify putting a whole BMC chip, right? But what, what if I created sort of a circle zero process or a, a, a very fundamental layer in the software that did BMC functions and then loaded the rest of the capabilities like you would on a server, sort of the virtual BMC? And that, in fact, you're a great straight man. I probably owe you a beer. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so here we go. We have G dot fast devices, and they come in four four wonderful flavors. Um, and then each flavor has options too. It's like going to a Starbucks. You really don't know what you're ordering. 
Uh, in this case, MDU applications are what we're looking at. So this is like apartment complexes and high-rise uh, condominiums. And um, on the MDU applications for the 16-port DPU, with, we have many different serving models. We'd like to serve people on coax and twisted pair. We'd like to be able to reverse power feed the device or power it locally. Because when you go into um, a condominium complex, you often don't have a lot of control about what was there, what you're allowed to do, and so you need a lot more flexibility about putting equipment there that solves the problems. And lastly, um, some companies also have a satellite service. And <laughs> it'd be nice if you could, if you could sort of combine the uh, satellite signals from the dish over the coax along with your broadband signals to get into the, into the living units. And so that's what this whole triplexers to mix video signals over coax is all about. I think it's you who has the satellite. It could be. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, so to, to do, a, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I do owe you a beer, don't I? Um, so the thing is this, is we thought that the best and, and most practical way forward was if we took the complex logic that was common to all of these designs, just made that once, and then have sort of this magic connector, the blue, the blue connector there, that would allow you to then interconnect these different kinds of media adapters, if you will. And so I'll use the same basic board and then connect onto it an ability to, to light up coax or twisted pair and to um, reverse power. That's what the RPF unit is, a reverse power feed unit. And, um, and the triplexer, and if you've heard of SWIM, you probably figured that all out again, right? So um, that's, that's the basic game afoot here, and we think it works pretty well in, in that regard. Okay. So, and then, you know, if we can do this for 16 ports, um, you can do it just as easily for 8 ports. And once again, it's the same, same basic technology, just scrunch down a little bit. Um, the one thing that is, I think, a little bit different is that we think in this size, we may come back and add another unit. And instead of having lots of uplinks, we might look for a capability to daisy chain. So I don't think there's anything, you know, other than it being smaller, there's, uh, that's probably the most important thing there. Now, um, now we get to a different kind of deployment model. The next unit is four ports, and this is now t tailored towards single family units, SFUs. And what you would expect this to be is a classical fiber to the curb kind of architecture, where instead of digging up everybody's front yard, you just simply bring fiber down the end of the road, and usually there's either phone poles or pedestals that come every couple hundred feet or yards. And then in, on the pole or in the pedestal, you'd put one of these very small devices. And on the northbound side, it would get fed with pond, like all the other units. But on the southbound side, you'd have the drop wire that goes to people's homes. So this is the sort of the, the twisted pair that goes from the curb into your house, and it's probably already there. And we don't have to dig up your begonias to, to get that there. Um, and there are sort of two different um, architectures that we've been looking at. One, well, first of all, they have the same uh, connector, that block that connects them, uh, probably to twisted pair. But on the up, up link side, one of the things that we think about is whether to integrate sort of the GPON SOC, or the, the GPON technology that goes up, upstream, or whether to make it in the form factor of like a pluggable optic. And you know, I know if you go out on the floor, you can see a number of suppliers that have GPON ONUs in, in sort of a SFP uh, form factor. And we're still kind of trying to decide what makes sense there. And it may be, you know, it may be that one or the other uh, works better or worse. And then lastly, there's um, sort of the simplest variation on the theme. And it's once again for single family units, this is where you're in an environment where we provide what we call fiber to the home. So this is your standard, you know, um, you know AT&T gigapower, for example. And if there's some reason that getting the fiber into your home becomes a big major headache, you don't want us to drill through your 
200-year-old house or something along those lines, then just sort of like a, a very early uh, GPON deployments, we would have a simple device that might get placed in the NID or on the outside of the house so the fiber comes up to the edge, and then we'd use G.fast to go into the house where um, with the newest technologies of G.fast, you'd get well over a gigabit in, in speed on, on that uh, coax or twisted pair. And we thought that in this kind of model, having both of the, both of the coax and twisted pair on one spec or one design would make more sense. And just like in the last case, one of the things that we're kind of thinking through is whether or not to use an SFP or to, or to simply use a, a SOC that does the GPON directly. All right, no questions or comments so far? No, well, we're getting there. Okay, so the question was, what's the rate of deployment of G.fast today? I don't know. Um, so G.fast is a kind of a recent technology. It is a DSL family, right? So up, up before now, uh, there was a uh, VDSL, which is probably well known for AT&T's original U-verse deployment. And VDSL does, oh gosh, on a really good day, on a really short link, maybe 75 megabits uh, in one direction. And then G.fast is sort of, well, if you shorten the links more and use more, therefore more bandwidth, you could get more speed over that. And so if you're talking about less than 100 meters or less than 200 meters, there's a, uh, what is it, 106 megahertz variation that's been out for a few years, and that can sort of approach a gigabit. And recently there's a 212 megahertz uh, variation that can go well over a gigabit on, on those kinds of loops. Um, in terms of deployment, AT&T is um, in, in field trials and is looking to deploy in this calendar year. Okay. All right, and then the last section is the open software stack. Okay, we talked about hardware a whole bunch, but you, you know, if you got the hardware and nothing to run it, that's kind of a bummer, right? And so, like you've probably seen in the previous, talk, previous talk, um, I'm gonna start with what we had before and what was the sort of starting point. Uh, this is the stack that we developed uh, with the Open GPON OLT. And so, um, what happened here is that you got a SOC firmware image runs on the silicon, and then there's a set of APIs that come from that provider. And then what we did is we, we wrote an inner working function that would take APIs that were specific to GPON in that case, or GFAST in the new case, and interwork that and make it look like it's a virtual Ethernet switch. And from there, we're able to use more classical agents for um, OpenFlow to, to provide the match action forwarding abstraction, and NetConf to do all the basic management that you need to, you know, set, setting all of your um, configurations. All right, so, but I talked a little bit in the last talk about kind of problems that we saw in that space. And so, if you remember, I talked about Voltha. And this is the section that Voltha covers. And so, one of the things that we're interested in doing is adding a driver for Voltha that would handle G.fast. And so, that way, the same the same management agent technology that we're developing for uh, GPON could also manage uh, G.fast. And in fact, many times when they're deployed, it's in conjunction. Now, the G.fast is kind of at the end of a pawn anyway in terms of how it's, um, how it's done. Okay, so, and with that, uh, are there any questions or, or comments? Yes? And then go back again, if you like them, okay. Oh, the one before that. I had a question. You show an open controller I'm sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you. You show an open flow controller, a configuration controller. You talk about own us, but let's say you would have a controller like open daylight, like you can define your model in YAG, and the yep. controller can talk that comp can talk and flow at the same time. Yes. Could you use a single controller? So the, the yeah, the question is, I show two controllers, an open flow and a configuration controller, and 
Could they be one? Yes, absolutely. You could do this all in either ONOS or in open daylight, whatever you like. It's, the thing is this, is that the forwarding plane, the match action rules are great for, um, for that, for forwarding. And so when we have the applications like um, authentication, multicast control, it lends itself really well to that. But what, if, what about when you want to start doing things like updating ONU firmware or you know, think, you know, that, that kind of bit, what I'd call fundamental management of the box, and in which case you're more or less obliged to use NetConf in that space. All right. Yep. Alan? Hardware abstraction. Okay. All right, so the question is, um, well, I answered HA, right? Um, the question is, what kind of companies are working on this in ON Lab? And um, ON Lab, I should say, these projects are under Linux Foundation. And there's a Linux Foundation Board of Directors that includes a number of different companies, mostly service providers and ON Lab. They're an, another member of that sort of open source community or board of directors. And when it comes then to, they set direction. What, what projects do we do and what direction is the team going in? Then there is who's contributing to the code. And what we find is that a lot of it is being done by um, Owen Lab. A lot is being done by the merchant silicon suppliers who are interested in making their, their chips useful and available. And then there are also um, a number of system integrators, or in some cases you could call them a legacy vendor that have been involved um, in, this, in this development. Okay, yeah, that's a great question. So the process that typically goes, the question was who agrees on the spec before open source coding begins? And the typical process that goes on at Owen Lab is you have to come with a proposal there was a proposal made to do this, to, to create this FOLTA project. And the proposal has to include what you intend to accomplish, how it relates to the other work at, um, in, in that organization, and who's going to help get it done, right? So if you've got all those things pulled together, usually it goes pretty easily to then go into a, a sort of a next phase where it becomes part of the overall project plan. It gets looped into and becomes part of a release of something or another further on down the road. Is that what you were looking for? Okay. I'm sorry, back here? Yeah, you. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much. The question was, um, when OpenFlow is used typically in a data center for uh, a switch, it's usually done on the out-of-band management channel. And once you put it into the field, how are you going? What do you do, right? It's, it's, do you? How does it work? And the thing is this: that um, two things. One is that even when it's not out in the field, when it's in a central office as part of Cord. Um, one of the things we did is we said that the agents need to be able to talk in band to two Tor switches. Remember, it was Alan's question earlier. If you're going to remove the control away from the box, don't you lose availability? And if you continue using the out-of-band single management port for open flow control, you have that single point of failure, right? And as a telco, they bang me on the head whenever I leave one of those laying around. So what we did is we created availability to manage the box through in the in-band uplinks. And they're, they're duplicated. There's an uplink goes to Tor switch one and an uplink that goes to Tor switch two. And we can manage that then in-band. And when there's a failure, it can fail over. So that's, that's trick number one. <laughs> trick number two is in the outside plant, it's in-band again. And if there's not a second link, we don't care. If, if it's gone, it's gone, right? It's, uh, 
<laughs> I mean, it's how it works today. If you, put a, if you put an access node in the outside plant and you've only got one fiber going out to it, that's it. <laughs> yep. Okay. Yep. Hans York. Thank you for asking the question. <laughs> I owe you a beer too. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I, seriously, I was making a joke beforehand. I should have brought a case of Red Bull for everybody right after lunch. <laughs> but um, the question now, if I can remember it after that, is um, what about the PMA and PMAA, which are these sort of management entities that were standardized or, or, or you know, specified by the Broadband Forum? And we intend to gobble that up into Volta and not require additional PMA or PMAA thingies. All right. Uh, the question is, what's behind G.fast? Why not do e uh, PON or Ethernet all the way? That's a good question. That's actually, uh, <laughs> um, so G.fast has been around for a couple of years. And if you look at its competitor technologies, I would say that they are now the 2.5G base T or the 5G base T, right? And they just emerged. So I, th I often wonder, <laughs> You know, and should I, be, should I be looking at those technologies for distribution into the home um, instead of G.fast? But right now, G.fast works over twisted, one twisted pair, not four, and it works over copper, and it gets me over a gigabit of speed. It gets me to about a gig and a half. So that's really good with the envelope of what we're providing a service today. Um, in future, I don't know. I, that, you know what happens next? if, if Two gig service becomes really important for a lot of customers. There probably need to be another technology, and maybe you know the two two and a half based two, you know the one, <laughs> two point two point five gig uh, base T. That might be really interesting. We've got a lot of pots lined out there. Yeah. Yeah, for sure, right, yeah, Alan. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, no, actually. Mm -hmm. So, uh, okay. So now uh, we won't say you were belly aching, but <laughs> the, the question was: No, no, it's a, it's fair, it's fair, and and you. Uh, it is absolutely. So the question, let me repeat it, is. Uh, if there's an existing deployment where a condominium or, or an existing um, facility has twisted pair and the twisted pair only gets you so much with, I don't know what your technology is, ADSL or, right? ADSL or VDSL? It's VDSL. So um, I would say very strongly that G.fast is an upgrade path for your situation. And it's for multiple potential reasons. If your condominium has just old, tired copper, and it's relatively short, uh, then G.fast should be able to pull more bandwidth out of that copper, even if it's old and crappy. And then there's a second opportunity, which is if your condominium has coax as well as twisted pair in it, we can put G.fast over the coax and do even better than that. So yes, G.fast is a, is a a thing that, you know, if AT&T puts it in your building, you will be happy. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. A lot of times the complexes have a homeowners association or an owners management association that sort of negotiates on behalf of everyone. And it will depend on, you know, how eager they are to get it and how eager we are to, to go in there. 
<laughs> That's handled, right? I'm over time? Okay. Out of scope. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Saved by Kang one. <laughs> All right. Oh gosh, I don't, the, uh, the question was, is there any speed difference between the two different typical RGs that are 59 and six that are used in interior wiring? And I don't know off the top of my head. Um, I know that they'd perform better than twisted pair does. <laughs> it oh, it worked better than the, twi yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> no, but I'm saying I, I don't think so either. I'm, I haven't seen, you know, I haven't seen a, uh, a comparison between the two. Yeah, huh? Is it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So back when you pull the CPU out of, let's say, an OLT, you have it, you know, that, that case where maybe you didn't pull it out completely. Mm -hmm. Is Ethernet the correct path or is it more of maybe PCIe or what, what, what are you visualizing to connect from the CPU, if it is really removed from the yep. So the question is, if you pull the CPU out and put it into uh, plain compute, is what is the best path between it, between uh, the two? And sort of the things that come up all the time for managing silicon are PCI Express, I squared C, and Ethernet. And Ethernet already goes over multiple hops. And if I wanted to create a new uh, uh, PCI Express switching system, I guess I could do that. I think I actually saw something out, <laughs> right? And maybe for high performance edge compute in the future, that might be an interesting, an interesting place to go. But for most of the silicon we worked with, Ethernet was an option and never bet against Ethernet, right? <laughs> okay. All right, well, th gosh, the, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, you putting up with me and I don't see too many people sleeping. <laughs>